Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Covenant Cast, where we discuss the past, present, and future of the tabletop gaming industry. I'm Zach. And I'm Steven. And today we're talking about rekindling the magic of what it was like to fully enjoy a game, particularly a trading card game, collectible game, by imposing limitations on yourself and maybe your group, and how by emulating what was forced whenever you were first being introduced to these hobbies, sometimes you can capture more joy in doing it today. just takes a lot of self-control. And is it possible? And is there even a a model for this? And have we effectively lost sight of it by uh, having the internet effectively feed us everything we want at every given moment? Uh, Join us. We hope you'll stick around. I'd like to go back. Well, that's why we're here, right? I mean, that's the whole limitation thing, isn't it? To the late 90s. Okay. Weave me a tale. I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe nine, ten-ish. Really had gotten into the Pokemon video game. Oh, man. I had the red version. My brother had the blue version. And you linked up the Game Boys, didn't you? had the cord to connect so we could battle it out. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Driving around in my mom's, the back of my mom's van. Did you guys trade a lot? Trade Pokemon? Yeah. Yeah, quite a bit. I never got really into trading. Well, there were things they that were- too were, special. Like, well, you don't trade. You don't trade the special things? Don't trade the special things. Definitely not. But really into Pokemon, my mom got me and my little brother started actually for the Pokemon TCG when we were kids. And as is the case with a lot of nine-year-olds, uh, budgets are limited, right? Yeah. And Most of us. Some people maybe not. Yeah. I, I think it's the case a lot of nine-year-olds, even- you know, nine-year-olds with very affluent families or parents uh, don't necessarily just have unlimited Pokemon TCG budgets. Sure. But the point is, uh, when, when I first started playing card games, and for a very long time, there was a natural restriction in that I, I, I could not just go buy more products. Yeah. Like, that was not a normal thing. You know what's interesting here, too, is that it's not... We think of it a lot of times, obviously, from our own life experience of being so young when this was happening. But I know there's also a lot of people who were in high school, in college, Mm -hmm. who, the you know, Magic and and Pokemon, these were hitting about that same time, equally as poor, effectively. You know what I mean? Or resource starved. Yeah, the the college student can't exactly go buy 20,000 boxes of Magic to get what they want. (laughs) Yeah, but... Back then, I remember, I mean, there were magazines with like prices of stuff in it. And there were early web, like not, I remember some websites existed, but we had like dial up internet back then. It was weird. So it wasn't even like you could, I couldn't go look at a list of all the stuff. I remember like you'd meet with your friends who also had cards and it's like, I've never seen number seven out of yeah, how yeah. many cards do you have number seven yeah what is that what is that even it's in the fire group and i don't it's an uncommon maybe number 80, 18 or 27 and like i just want to know what's that card mm-hmm. and sometimes it's a card you really want sometimes it doesn't matter but i remember man i was on the hunt for that original charizard for a year some say you still are on the hunt yeah uh i remember i don't remember the exact time i just remember wanting that card for a long time and i i would dream of of like what it would be like to be able to buy even a couple booster boxes and just like gosh just it it wasn't even a buy the box product it it was like oh man if i can get three packs oh yeah eight packs four packs yeah it was definitely i i collected in packs for pokemon yeah it was but i like the dream I, i remember seeing singles um at a store, they had like Charizard and they had booster boxes. And I think it was a vintage stock. And you could Char- buy the whole box. You could buy the whole box. I, yeah. I don't know that I ever saw but that until the Star Wars TCG. They would have a box that was opened with packs in the yeah. little glass shelf, but then behind it were boxes that you could obviously Ooh. buy. But just seeing the Charizard, I think it was 125, 150 bucks for the one card. And I, Charizard, I started with that character in the game and like it was just, I, that card looks I don't know why it looks so cool but I just think it's it looks a dragon, so cool. man. Yeah, and uh wanted it so bad, but even just in playing the game, just constantly having to make it work. Yeah. 
in general. Um, and then you fast forward, at least for me. Even in the Game Boy, mm -hmm. right? It's like sometimes you fight against somebody who clearly has something that is wrecking you. And it's like, all you can do is either spend more time finding a Pokemon that can wreck them or make your Pokemon better. <laughs> those, yeah. are, those are your options. And sometimes right? <laughs> you have fire Pokemon, they have water. And like, yeah. you better start training up the lightning stuff <laughs> and the right. earth stuff, you know, like, come on. But, you know, you fast forward a little bit and we had the a lot of different TCGs we played. So like when we were teenagers, played the Star Wars TCG together and had a little more access to finding money. First time I split a booster box. Yeah, we were mowing would grandma's lawn and that kind of often thing. Often get yeah. enough money to split boxes and then you can trade and buy. By then, there were websites where you could buy singles, like that yeah. Dark Sacrifice that came in. Your mom saved the day what on that an, one. What a champion. Yeah. yeah. They basically didn't come in until the day the tournament happened. But she checked the mailbox, found them, and brought us brought them to the tournament. Drove to all us. the way to Tulsa, an hour-long yeah. drive to get them to us as we started the tournament. Yeah. Literally like 10 minutes before we were sleeving them in the parking lot. Crazy. So cool. Um, Thanks, Mom. So, But by then, you can buy singles. You could, there was some amount of trading on the Rebel Basers website happening. Mm -hmm. You could always you trade, to roll the trade dice. locally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not even like eBay where there's right, We're both going to send it at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Right. <laughs> yeah. I'll send you $32 cash for that crate Dragon, but you better send it. <laughs> you better send it. Crazy. Anyways, um, so we had a little better access then, but it it's definitely wasn't unlimited. But then after that, there was Spoils TCG as a different phase, but then we pivoted hard into non-collectible games. Mm -hmm. where you just had everything. And I would say even spoils the assumption that we had going in was that we would get everything we needed. Like yeah. we we would well, have what we needed to play with. By then we were a company mm -hmm. and we had a singles inventory and we were selling stuff. And part of the pitch early when there were years of work happening with no one getting paid was like, well, at least you'll get to play the game without having to buy anything. Yeah, which was everything at the which, time. That was a big benefit of, of the moment. But... Then after that, we went, there were LCGs, played a number of those, and I, thought, I think just kind of got used to this, like, you have access to all of it, mm -hmm. five, which is cool, and on a budget. And then Destiny came out, which was my, like, window back into collectability. That's a good ramp. Yeah, but Destiny, even Destiny thinking about it is, we, I, we mentioned this before, but it's only s somewhat collectible. Yeah. Because the rarity system effectively... Every box has six legendaries. There are 18 legendaries in a set. If you buy six boxes, you are probably going to get a play set. You only need two of each thing of every legendary. They, didn't they kind of collate it with that in mind? Like that was the goal? You would never get two of the same legendary in a box. Yeah. So yeah. It, very, you, if you buy th four boxes, you probably have one of each legendary. And then you have six to trade. Yeah. So it was collectible, but it was not, you know, like, later in the story we get to flesh and blood which is a collectible game and there are cards that are only one in every 40 booster boxes which is a different level it's a lot more collectible as collect even say. the legendaries yeah. from the early sets were one in 20 boxes yeah which well, is a different level the and what you're building to here i think is that by the time you get to flesh and blood it's one in 40 but you need you're gonna get it <laughs> i mean like it's not i mean if there was a one in 40 booster box card when you're nine it's i'll never see this card like yeah. even if i do well, i would i would freak out when i was nine if there's a one in a four booster box card i'm probably never gonna see it yeah i mean i, I might get one yeah uh, but not if there's five different cards like that there's no way i'm seeing all of them but now you we fast forward to adult life more disposable income more awareness of the hobby more information online about rarity levels print runs yeah. and the internet singles so like you know if you're playing flesh and blood i think you can buy Three boxes, four boxes, get all the commons and rares in a play set. And then that's they're each at this point eighty bucks. So let's say you buy four boxes, it's three hundred and twenty dollars. You can probably spend seven hundred and fifty dollars a set and and get it all. And that you know what's great? And this is kind of the point of the podcast, right? So this <laughs> this, this is where episode. we this is where we start. Yeah, the point of the episode. Uh, we're talking about rekindling the magic. So there's a lot you see around these days when Flesh and Blood first came out, when, you know, Final Fantasy TCG, Digimon, uh, MetaZoo, whatever it is. A lot of the dialogue online is how much do I have to spend every set to get everything? Like that, that's kind of the, the assumed entry point mm -hmm. on the online dialogue in particular was how much do I have to spend to get everything? 
The assumption here, which is based on many, many years of Magic and Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, is that if you want to play it in a really serious way, in, in an a- actual way, if you want to compete, you're going to have to have every card and all the max copies of every card. So the question that players are asking is, well, I want to do well in this game. How much am I going to have to spend every month or every year or every you know quarter, whatever it is? And that dialogue, like that idea completely, it's a totally, it's like a new thing compared to when TCG is first started. And certainly for us, and depending on where you were in your life, what that, what a new TCG meant for you. So it used to be maybe get a pre-constructed deck and have a few packs every week or every month, and you can make that deck better. And you can play against other people who are basically kind of doing the same thing and has morphed into the first thing you have to do is the chore, which is get everything. The second thing you have to do is get good at the game and actually win events, right? Like this is kind of the competitive circuit. And so what we're talking about here on the cast today is what we've done with sorcery, what we talked about doing with Warhammer Champions, what we tried to do in various contexts of some other games throughout the years is what is their value? Like, is it worth it to limit ourselves in our purchasing and the cards that we have access to in order to create the kind of fun that we remember having whenever resources were not unlimited and cards were very rare, effectively. And that's what we're doing. That's what we just, we just got done with our last sorcery stream of the series, this one box meta series. And we call it that because we just have one sorcery box. Uh, we can only have one, so it's it's limiting itself. But we played draft with it. We played some sealed games with it. Uh, now we did some constructed games mm-hmm. with it. We don't have everything that we need. There are cards that we don't have access to we're starting to scrap around with even after the game we played today is like, all right, I want to change the constructed deck I just built within the little limited card pool that I have to start answering the little meta game that we have going on here. And by my assessment and everything I can uh, I can appreciate here, it's we've gotten so much more fun out of that one box than if it was just one of six that we were opening to build our collection mm-hmm. to build a constructed deck. And I think that's something that is easy to lose sight of as we kind of advance in years and uh, have access to more and more cards. And this becomes the assumption of a collectible game uh, versus like having that as a mindset and a philosophy going into a collectible game and building a community that uh, that agrees with that approach. Right. Like whether it's on our discord or there's a certain group of people, you know, that there is this concept of why don't we impose some limitations on ourselves, escalation leagues, you know, these kinds of things that will allow us all to have more fun. If we all stick to it, we're all going to have more fun. If one person breaks it, yep. it's it's awful again, right? Because one person has all the cards, they start beating everybody. And then it's like, well, that's not fun anymore. So is this something that A, should be done? Uh, and I don't mean like ethically or something, but is the value of it worth the limitations versus the wide open field of playing with all the cards that you ha- can have access to? And if it is worth it, how should we reshape our understanding of collectible games in light of the reality that it can be more fun if we just do it differently? Yeah, yeah. And potentially it's more fun and more affordable. Yeah. Which makes it more accessible to more people potentially. And if you're a new player and you have like, there's a lot of factors there, but I think you mentioned it only works as long as everyone at the table is willing to commit to it. Right. And one of my favorite examples, this is Warhammer champions, (laughs) a collectible game after destiny that we played for a little bit. It's since um, gone to greener pastures, Mm. but great game. We originally started and all, all of us were like, we don't want to deep dive into another collectible, a new collectible game. It's not the vibe. There's different factions. I think there were literally four of us splitting because there were four factions and we just, me, you, and Jonathan Robert. Sounds like sorcery, doesn't it? Yeah. And repeat on the way. It was like, all right, cool. We'll just, we'll stick to the box that we got or the box. I think we did a bo- case of four boxes. I don't remember. And uh, not to point any fingers, but <laughs> one person in the group, I, we were all really getting into it. Yeah. Like it's super fun. We realized it was really good. Yeah, and then it was, and then we started seeing the cards we didn't have, and then someone broke, and it was like, well, I ordered some singles. Yeah, and then once the floodgate opened, 
we were all drowning in that game. And then everybody has to go get their perfect deck. Yeah. Which we did. We did. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily wrong. And it wasn't necessarily unfun. Because I had a great time. But if, if if we, I, I said this on the Sorcerer's Chain, if it were the, th- the case that every player actually only got one booster box, like every, let's say, two or three months, and you just had, that's just what you had to work with, period. Personally, I think I would have more fun. If you had to trade and like... And like just slow grow, build it. And like every every couple of months, I'm opening a new box that has... Like I'm still excited, right? Instead of... I think the the burn rate on a collectible game right now, you have a set every three or four months coming out. It hits. You have, it's like a one to three week period where there's this intense opening and trading and collecting period and then it's done. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, at this point I don't open a box of Uprising and think like... It's a fab set. Mm, like I'm super excited. Now they, they're doing some really cool, like the Majestic Dragons are always cool to open. Yeah. In that in that set. Back to Dragons, right? Here we are. Um, and the cold foils, the the legendary stuff. Now it it, it feels special because it is so rare. Um, and they did some really clever stuff with two point But I think the main point is, if we would have more fun in a restricted style, uh, why why isn't that happening? Well, so let's think about it. Um, first of all, is it even conceivable to? So here's what we know: we know it is possible if a group of four people at a local store or just a friend, you know, their friend group, if you're out there, if there's four people and they all decide we're all going to get one booster box each and we're going to, we're not going to add any cards to it. We get one booster box each and then we're going to build new uh, stuff maybe once a month and we're going to add three packs every month until the next set. That would A, be phenomenal. I mean, it'd be so fun. But then B, it's like, that's doable. People can do that right now. And there's probably some people out there that mm-hmm. are doing that. Like and I would, players. Because we now have the uh, one of the greatest channels in our Discord ever, the uh, podcast discussion channel. If you are doing that currently, let us know. Come to the Discord, say something. Let us know how you're doing it, what the setup is, et cetera. I'd also be curious, hypothetically, in the, that scenario, would you, do you think you would actually enjoy it more? Yeah. Because I would, and I, I think that's that's why we gravitate towards draft and sealed. It's that it, it's forced, right? And it's it's achievable because it's it's momentary. There's nothing that yeah, you must yeah. do it. It's like yeah. oh, you're sitting here, you have six packs, open them, build a deck, and play, and that's a fun challenge, and it lets you build your collection, and it's successful new players, and you achieve kind of the same thing. It's one of the great hallmarks of the collectible model is that you have draft and, and sealed. Yeah, honestly, I think, and. I think that's part of why I really like that. But even after you do collect a set, draft and sealed becomes, it's still fun, but it's a little less. A little less fun. Fun. I think a, a part of this too is the the infrastructure around a game as well. So Fab is a tournament game. Yeah. <laughs> Built for it. Organized play is crazy. It, it's a, an event slash tournament, very focused game. And so that's also where even with draft and sealed, if there are in air quotes serious events, knowing what the cards are, like removing the mystery, removing the discovery of it, is actually important. Like as ex- hard analysis, as exciting as it would be to open something you've never seen in the middle of a draft, you are choosing efficiency and being good at the event over the excitement and the mystery, right? And I think that's happening a lot, and. That's part of what made me drawn so much to sorcery in general as a game. It's just starting out and saying, that's not really why we're here. Like the the tournament focus. And so there's kind of a chance with this game specifically for me. Uh, I, you know, I, I back the Kickstarter. I'm getting a number of boxes, but hmm. even then I, I'm, I'm less, uh, I feel less pull to just open it all immediately. I wanted to pull up a comment here from, I think it was it was Fila. She, you said that you weren't uh, you weren't doing spoilers. You said you had given up spoilers. Mm-hmm. So this is another idea of, of self limitation leading to more yeah, yeah. enjoyability. I'm looking in the Discord right now, trying to find who said it. It's Fila's master, right? Uh, that was Fila who said that. Yeah, but there was somebody who said, and I apologize, I'm I'm missing it. I just haven't seen it. But it could have been Fila that was saying. Um, 
I was going to effectively competitive events. So I needed to know what was in the magic set. So I know what removal they might have, mm -hmm. what the cost curve of these cards are, et cetera. So that the desire to do well in that event. I think it was Shadow. Was it Shadow? Because Shadow was saying that he didn't have the budget to buy cards. So he had to win them. That's right. So yeah. Go to drafts, win booster boxes by being good at it. And that's how he collected the cards. And would have to find out because you can't really be good at it if there's a bunch of unknowns because you yeah. already have the unknowns, which is your opponent's hand. If you don't know what could be in their hand, then it's just wide open, right? Yeah. It's the Wild West. So yeah, so there there is, like you're saying, that there's that tension between I want to do well at a draft or a sealed event, but I also love the idea of the mystery of opening packs and exploring that, especially with other people. If you don't know what's in my hand, even conceivably, and I don't know what could be in your hand, yeah. That is where we have to have a mutual agreement to come to that space together and actually make that kind of a thing happen. Yeah, and related to the spoilers, right? It's the same with just even opening a pack. Like if neither of us know what could be in there, it's a more exciting moment for everybody. Yeah. Um, that's part of why I, I, I don't... I get from a marketing perspective why you do spoilers. You want people to know enough about a product that they want to buy it before they buy it. But I do feel like it's like the... Um, you see this happening in... Uh, I'm trying to think of a a parallel example but essentially where the you know at first maybe there's not like i remember star wars tcg you might get a couple cards it was not a lot of cards that we knew going in yeah and it might be in like a magazine mm -hmm. it was like the back page of a magazine but and then you advance it to today and i think what happens is it's like oh like when we show a card from the next set people get excited People yeah. talk about it. There's yeah. people doing podcasts and people doing YouTube channels. In fact, there's a lot of YouTube channels and podcasts that are solely based on that. It's like preview content for the next set of something. Yeah. And why wouldn't you as a publisher? It's it's almost the same where it's like I'm removing the mystery because I want to win the tournament. A publisher is removing the mystery because they want to maximize the pre-excitement. I mean, movies have previews, you know? Mm -hmm. But even then, I noticed this um, when we're watching old movies, sometimes we'll watch trailers on YouTube before we watch the movie. Yeah. And they they tend to do a lot better job not telling you what the movie's, everything about the movie, basically. Yeah. There's a ton of trailers that you watch that are more modern. It's like, I basically know what happens in this movie, yeah. I think. And usually you're right. Yeah. Right? And I feel like that's what's happening with preview season for a lot of games where that's part of why I like the way Fab did it. If you're going to do it, they condense it down. They've said basically nothing about the next set. Mm -hmm. They let the current set just breathe. And then at some point it hits and it's like two or three weeks of just like lots of excitement all at once. And then the set comes out and there's this wave of excitement happening. But if I were picking, I would actually love to be able to go to the pre-release events blind. Yeah. Because it's the mystery and the excitement, yeah, right? No and that previews. discovery. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, that that hits. And here's, so so it's so, just said so like 20 times, but it's so weird the way that humans work. Mm -hmm. You know, like what we're saying here. Because it's not, it hasn't, it's only tangentially related to tabletop or anything else. But this is the reality that we face daily. Like, if you really only eat, uh, let's say, a piece of chocolate cake once a year, mm -hmm. that is way more enjoyable than if you do it once a day. Totally. Right? So there's, there's just a lot of diminishing returns in everything. And it's the same with cards, right? The same with collectible cards. If you have everything immediately, you don't get to savor the experience of getting to everything. Yeah. Um, and this could apply to literally everything that you're doing almost everything that you're doing i won't say everything because you know surely there's an exception somewhere but almost everything that you're doing you could take a more enjoyment focused approach uh in an intentional way it's, it's like a healthier enjoyment right yeah think about tv shows in the same way i i i definitely understand i've done my fair share of binging tv shows yeah <laughs> don't get me wrong oh yeah like i spent a day yeah just, just, just uh, beaching i'm just up. gonna smoke this show right just now wailing <laughs> Uh, you get really into a show. There's a bunch of episodes. I've done that with books and podcasts too. But, yeah. but I, I actually I prefer TV shows that are once a week. Yeah, it's just like a you get a little bit. You can think about it. You can talk about it. You can process it. You can look forward to the next thing. Perfect example. And then you do it again and again. And versus like Netflix is like here's the whole season. Yeah. Um, and you know I do get a certain amount of enjoyment out of that. But I think in terms of maximizing excitement and overall enjoyment, of course the prolonged version 
is is more enjoyable. Yeah, isn't that this is just a really good example when you think about it like that? Mm-hmm. If Game of Thrones had released well, aside from the last few seasons, let's just assume Game of Thrones doesn't uh, effectively drop the ball at the one yard line. Let's just assume all of those episodes release all at once. Yeah, you have two to three weeks where the people who are absolutely into it have seen everything and they talk to each other and they try to get you to talk to them and you're like, no, I haven't watched it all yet. And then they're done with it. Yep. And they go do something else. And then the slow rollers <laughs> finish it and be like, oh yeah, I'll look at what they were saying three months ago whenever yeah. everybody had already binged and, and finished this. And then they're done with it. And then everybody's done with it. And it's the same thing with card games. I yeah. mean, it's the same thing we're talking about here with the moment where we opened that like water ward gym on stream, that was an incredible moment, right? On on sorcery. And it was like, oh my gosh, we haven't seen this card. This card looks amazing, etc. And then we put it away and we come back next week and we're like, what else are we gonna find in these packs? If we spent two hours just opening 16 booster boxes, yeah, and then we said, Okay, we got every card in the set, we can look at all of them. Wow, isn't that cool? And then that part of the game is kind of done for us. Yeah, like it's entirely done. And then it's like, okay, now we only have one part of the game left, which is we got to find the best way to combine these cards. And I think that's where people get so lost sometimes, like just jumping right to that conclusion. It's like binging the TV show. Yeah. You know, it's the same kind of behavior where you you it's really enjoyable when you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Like that first box, going right into that second box is like, yeah, I want another freaking yeah, box. Of course. Did we want to open the two packs that we didn't open today? We absolutely wanted to. But there's this element of restraint that works in your favor if your whole goal is happiness, enjoyment, et cetera. And so choosing not to binge, choosing to simply open a few packs, and then if you have enough people around you that are willing to do the same, that is what I would consider that rekindling of the magic. And all it is is increasing enjoyment you're getting out of every dollar you're spending too. Yeah, and and it's it's challenging for multiple reasons. We've talked about some of them, but I definitely get the, like, it's hard to stop human nature. It's so, it, it, it's, it's the, it's the whole thing. Yeah. It's the whole. It really is. Life. Um, but it it's the recognition I, I'm afraid of what would happen if Pokemon were coming out today and I was in my current position. Like it's just 20 boxes, right? I mean, I, it's how I'm going to get the Charizards. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a place out of the Charizards and Blastoise and the Venusaurus period. Yeah. So what is that? Um, so, so, but like, I think, I think there's two parts to this. I think one is if you want something, you're capable of doing it and it, you don't perceive it as unhealthy. It, like for me, I understand Oreos are not healthy. Right. And I, I I used to really love Oreos. I I actually since the whole food thing, it's it's dude, challenging. Dipped for in me. milk, man. Oh my gosh. Yeah, dude. Oreos and it's milk. The is, great, yeah. It's the greatest thing. Man. You got to get them just the right softness. But like I know that that's not good for me. And so, it's it's actually helpful because you get immediate feedback on that. Yeah. You expand or <laughs> you feel bad. Yeah. Right? Like within an hour, it's like, oh, if you had 20 Oreos, then. Yeah. Like I, my, uh, you know, John from college, my good friend from college. Yeah. There's a ton of Johns in our life. His favorite uh, artist is Pink. Yeah. Yeah. He, he will always surprise you. He destroyed you. me when he told me that in his truck. I can't. His old blue pickup Zach, truck. Of all of the things that he could have said in that moment, I honestly don't think there was a more surprising answer to his favorite. Yeah his favorite musical it's pretty act. Good. Could have been Tool and he would have been less surprised. I would have been less surprised. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I remember one time um, we were in, in college, he had a sleeve of cookie dough. Oh no. Yeah. And it, you know where that goes, right? Did he like, eat the whole thing? Yeah, he ate the whole thing. It was bad. <laughs> it got, got really uncomfortable. Um, but point is, I know eating Oreos is bad for me, right? Uh, especially, you know, in, in uh, what do you call it? No, in, in limitation or in... Uh, Restraint? Small, amount, small amounts. Uh, yeah. Anyways, it, it, it's the same with alcohol. Same with it. Yeah. It's like... Moderation. And mo- in moderation, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, it's not that... It's not like, like going to... One Oreo a year is not going to do anything bad. <laughs> sure. Your body can handle not. that, right? Humans yeah. are adaptable. But I know eating 20 is bad. What doesn't feel um, certainly bad is opening 20 boxes of flesh and blood. Yeah. Because like, if you can financially afford it and there's something you want, and then there's no real immediate 
feedback on that. Like it's not like outside you, of you just own everything you want to own. So you like, own everything and achi- you have an achievement. It's like I I did it. I yeah. got everything I wanted. Or now I know what I need to trade for or whatever it is. Um, so that that is a part of it. There's there's not like a negative. In fact, you're kind of like especially if you're buying it from like a local store or something. There's almost a positive feedback. Like the store's like so grateful you did it. So now you feel good about doing this thing. Yeah. Um, and we're grateful anybody who buys 20 boxes 100%. from us. You can. Yeah. Which is not the same thing as opening 20 boxes. Sure. Like you can True. buy 20 boxes. How you use those 20 boxes. Sure. You could roll them out one a month for the next 20 months. Yeah. Maybe uh, you're that person. It, for sure. Um, but with a, a typical, that's what sorcery just brings up a lot of cool questions. Because with a typical card game, it's a three to four month release cycle. So they actually play into the fact that they're not expecting the excitement and interest from this one set to last a long time. Mm -hmm. Like they don't need to last forever. New set hits, there's a natural month of excitement. Then things change. The meta's changing and shifting. People are figuring stuff out. About the time it's settling down, here come previews for the next set, right? Yeah. And there's a cadence to that. But it does make you step back. I think sorcery is making me step back and and ask the question. Because just the way it's designed, one set a year, inherently makes me want to go slower Mm -hmm. i don't i don't feel the need like i'm going to miss out on the excitement and exciting conversation if i don't have the cards now and i can't play the decks now because there's just more time like before it's this is not the conversation to have it's kind of like not only a tv show but a tv season where if you miss the season and you show up six months later you still have six months to catch up on the season yeah and, and be a part of the ongoing conversation. Yeah, you can get there in time. You know, you talking about that, there's there's actually two things here that are fascinating to me. Like one is there's certainly a psychology and a consideration for of anything that I might want to do if it's harmful for me directly, uh, be noble and don't do it. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's like I can deny the thing because I know that it's bad for me. And smoking a cigarette. Good example for a... me recently is coffee. Yeah. So right on. I got COVID, noticed I hadn't had coffee in a week. And I was like, just, you know, in I've been doing the food stuff. And I was like, I just want to try not having coffee for at least a month. Mm-hmm. When a month was fine, was feeling good. Uh, and recently I'm, I'm about to go to France for a fab tournament. And I was like, I can't not have coffee there. Yeah. Um, so I've started dipping my toe back in. But I set myself a limitation because I, I love coffee. I love the way it tastes. Um, I, I don't necessarily need the chemical reaction of caffeine in the long form. If you have too much of it and the pandemic, I started having more of it and all that. Socially, I love coffee. I love hot drinks. Mm-hmm. Just every time we do a pot, like right now, if I, I would, it would be great to have just a hot <laughs> drink, right? A hot cup of mm-hmm. coffee right now. But because the weather's also turned. That's the other piece. Oh, of this. man. Once it goes, it's it's over. Yeah. But I put a limitation on myself. Uh, obviously, France is different. There's vacation, less limitations. But I'm currently planning on only having coffee on a routine basis at our, like, 10 o'clock coffee time at the office. Yeah. One cup, three or four days a week, and that's it. Yeah. So I'm just checking that out for a minute. That that That's playing into the... The, the second part of this paradigm, right? So there's one that is, is this harmful? Yes, no. If no, you you can do it if you want, right? But the second one is, and this is, I think, maybe this is an important step. I feel like there are times when I'm, I feel good and I'm taking these steps and there are times whenever I'm not. And that is not asking the question, is this harmful? But asking the question, how can I enjoy this the most? Bingo. And that is, that is a different way of life. Yeah. Of thinking about it. Because if, if you said to yourself, uh, Zach, your internal dialogue, right? This is your little internal brain talking okay, out. Yeah. It's like, Zach, uh, which is what your internal voice sounds like, right? Zach, hello, my yeah. name is Zach. Uh, <laughs> Just a little, little whiny. <laughs> <laughs> Zach. <laughs> hey, play all the burn spells, Zach. Mm-hmm. Burn them all, burn them all. <laughs> um, Kill them, kill them. If your internal monologue said, how can you enjoy coffee the most? Mm-hmm. What is the answer to that, the 10 o'clock only 10 o'clock uh, having the coffee? Is that really like, is that the final form of that question? It, it's definitely, I think the inverse is easier to suss out, which is I love coffee. I love hot tastes. I can have high high quality coffee at work and at home. I mm-hmm. have everything set up to make that super easy. And left unchecked, you know, just pure human nature, my own nature, personal human, my personal human nature. Mm-hmm. Anytime I'm thinking, I'd really enjoy a cup of coffee right now. And there is 
an understanding in my own subconscious that more than two or three, four cups of coffee a day, you know, it's a long day, four cups. Mm -hmm. More than that is probably bad. Yeah. Well, and there's yeah. science about one or two cups a day can be healthy yeah. and all that kind yeah. of stuff, antioxidants, whatever. But un unchecked, it's really easy to slide into three or four cups a day every day. Anytime you want coffee, you're having it. And it's the delayed gratification concept, right? If you have, like another thing I really like is Reese's cups. Yeah. I hear <laughs> that, man. <laughs> I, hear yeah, I hear that. Preach. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, if you have a Reese's cup, like let's say you had two individually wrapped and you were like, I'm going to have, this sounds good. I'm this gonna is have a one. marshmallow test. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like, well, do you want two today or one today, one tomorrow <laughs> or one today, one next week? And hypothetically, or if you were like, hey, I'm going to wait till next week to have, or I'm going to wait till the weekend to have it. That's when I like let loose mm -hmm. a little. I do think if you have to wait three days for something, you enjoy it more. Yeah. In the same way, I, I'm going to be honest, when I was uh, finally got that Charizard, my uncle had taken me and my little brother to go see episode one, Star Wars. Back when he had to buy a movie tickets on site, went to Vintage Stock while we were waiting. It was our birthday. It was around our birthday. Bought us some packs of Pokemon. Open Nothing better than those packs. Man. Oh my goodness. Open them really quickly. I have one left. He's like, hey, can I have one of your packs? He's in the front seat. I'm like, yeah, sure. He bought a pack for us. And then he's like, ah, is Charizard any good? And I was like, stop messing with me. <laughs> yeah. like, no, I've been, uh, this is the only thing I've wanted for a year. Yeah. And then I'm like, stop messing. Uh, and then he turns and shows it to me. I start screaming. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I I haven't been that excited about opening a card since that point. And I had, yeah. I had to wait a year plus to get that thing. Yeah. And there was a real chance that I would never get it. Yeah. Like that was very feasible mm -hmm. in my nine-year-old brain. Like ultimately thinking about it, it's like, well, at some point, someday I'll probably be able to buy this. Yeah. But at nine, it was this risk of like, when are they going to not have this pack anymore? Like we're all just playing a game with ourselves. Yeah. So I, I think to answer your kind of coffee question, I think it's easy not to ever ask the question, what would actually bring me the most happiness or joy out of the actions I'm already going to do? Same thing with a TV show. It's easier to hit next. Sometimes Netflix does it for you. Yeah. It's like, I don't, I'm just sitting here. Somehow I'm watching Too Hot to Handle right now. And how did I get here? Yeah. And I can't well, look away. How, how did FBoy Island <laughs> turn on? What's happening here? And then all of a sudden it's like, it's just a train wreck happening on the screen. Yeah. And you're sitting there and then ends. And it's like, well, if you don't do anything for five seconds, it's gone. <laughs> here comes another. I man. guess I'll just do one more, right? Wonder what yeah. happens. Um, and, and a lot of those, the content like that is designed to do that. Yeah. It's designed to leave a hook at the end. And, Good books do this. Get to the end of a chapter, and it leaves you wanting the next chapter. Yeah. And it flows into it. And shouldn't good booster packs do this? Shouldn't good collectible games do this, right? We have to understand there is a, a clash mm -hmm. where, like, the publisher of anything is going to win the most whenever somebody's consuming as much as fast as possible. That, that has to be the goal of most marketing. Um, so if you don't impose some kind of self, either there's actual limitations, I can't afford it, or I don't have the time to do it, or there's self-imposed limitations of if I fall into this uh, just consumption pattern, I actually just won't enjoy it as much. Yeah, and it's which it's, it's hard to get there though. And and practically, you know, the thing I was thinking is it'd be really cool if a publisher actually published a game in a way that was forced restriction. Yeah, it'd be tough, but it's it's a challenge for again on the publisher side practical reasons that are similar but different, which is, well, if you design a set of cards and you make all the art and you hit print on all the booster boxes or whatever, let's say flesh and blood, right? The only way to get cards is at local draft events and each store can host one draft event a week. And maybe you can only play in one draft event a week as a player. Mm -hmm. So you get your three packs a week. Suddenly every draft is like, crazy because you're like i need the i want to build this deck that i and like i'm having to build a deck out of very few cards up front um and six months later drafting that set is still going to be super relevant yeah and like you're still looking for cards and like you, anyways so the problem with that though is that as a publisher it's kind of like eating all the oreos at, right now because you can which is i've made this game i've made this set there's a bunch of people out there who are willing to buy a lot more of this product right now. Let them eat Oreos, man. And so it's like, 
I'm not gonna let the Oreos go bad. <laughs> right. You gotta <laughs> toss you gotta, gotta keep toss them to the Oreos. Sling right? Oreos. Yeah. If a publisher's goal, because I don't think as humans we ask this question of ourselves a lot, and I don't think businesses are either. Mm-hmm. But if you're a publisher designing a game, I think maximizing the enjoyment people are having out of the game is actually relevant. And if there was a I'm I'm curious, I don't know if it'd work, but if there was a game that was measured that forced restrictions onto people. I would love to see if it would actually end up being even more attractive to more people who can't buy 20 boxes at once. Yeah. And or even the people that can just find out they enjoy it better. Mm -hmm. Right. This other it's like the weekly release of the TV show versus the binging and that kind of thing. Um, Because it feels like it can't help but create the delayed gratification. And, you know, you just create all these moments where you don't have the. The person that has it all versus someone that just doesn't have it all. Yeah. Was this what the LCG was kind of trying to be? I mean, it it maximized in a different direction. Mm-hmm. It basically said there's not going to be a lot to have, but everybody can have it all. Yeah. Um, and so it technically was every month. If you think about the entire card pool over six years, let's say that that's all happening. Mm-hmm. It's it's dripping out the card pool one month at a time, yeah. slowly. And everybody can stay on the same page. It's not overwhelming until you have to start from zero. That, of course, is where it fails. That is, is yeah. And it also, it, it gave you everything, right? So the restriction with the collectible game, you inherently don't have everything. And there's a tantalization to that. And there's a discovery to that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is where the unique deck game kind of comes in. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and it's so funny. Like, I will say this forever. The, of the 10 comments you'll get on anything about a unique deck game, there's always one out of 10. That's like, I don't understand this. This game can't possibly work. Uh, there's no deck building. There's no deck building. There's no deck building. That, I mean, that's that's literally the critique is there's no deck building. In the deck yeah, building. Also the greatest strength of it. <laughs> Which is funny because it's it speaks to a different psychological profile, right? Mm-hmm. So for us that limitation and that discovery is high on the list of enjoyment of a card game. And maybe that came from nostalgia. Maybe it comes from the fact that that's how we first experienced it. Maybe if we had always had all the cards the moment that they came out, we wouldn't even be thinking in this way. Mm -hmm. So it could all be that rosy-eyed childhood, everything, right? Everything was better. Uh, Even the Reese's Cups were better then, man. Like video games were better. One one side note to that, I will say, I meant to say this earlier. As a kid... I thought it would be better if I could have everything. Dude, you know how much I was going to play video games all day when I was eight? 100%. I was like, dude, when I'm out of the house and I'm by myself, I'm going to play these things all the time. Yeah. I don't play video games at all. Yeah, I'm, I don't either. <laughs> just zero. But now, it, it's this is a grass is greener situation too. Yeah. To an extent. Huh, yeah, 100%. Oh, I yeah. thought you were going farther with that. But yeah, no, no, like, point I, taken. That's what I want to know. It's like, <laughs> I think at all times, it's easy to be like, remember how much fun we had as kids? Yeah. But as kids, I remember how much I dreamed of just being able to buy the Charizard that I wanted and play the deck that I wanted. And how frustrating it was because I didn't have, I had Charmanders, but not Charmeleons, like or and not enough of them. So like, anyways. But I think that's ultimately the point: is we have gotten to the point where we can conceivably do those things, and we've tried it both ways. And for you and I, it is actually more enjoyable to not have the things that we thought we always wanted. Yeah. And to leave the mystery and to leave the, the chase. Yeah. You, you were talking about this on the, I think it was on the Discord, which is basically you reference collecting the comic book page, collecting cards of nine, like the nine pocket page Loved art them. that goes together. Yeah. So, and cool. then someone asked you hypothetically if you could, because the internet is the other elephant in this room. Yeah. Not only do you know all of what all of them look like and that they exist, right? It used to be a panel of nine and you haven't even seen the pieces. Yeah, you don't even know what the next scene Yeah, looks you just like. know you have Cyclops yeah. and Wolverine kind of doing a thing here, and there's a gap, and then Storm's over here. And it's like, I need to see this scene, you know, fully realize. But you can see that on the internet now, and there's spoilers, and all that stuff gets spoiled a lot earlier, and all that, that information. But you also have a, um, like, ability to get all of it. So it used to be, even Charizard, for me... Occasionally, you would get to go to Tulsa every couple months. You could go and look in, in the vintage stock, sealed case. Sometimes they had a Charizard there. Sometimes they didn't. Yeah. You don't get a look on the internet. You don't get to see all the stuff. You don't get to print proxies. 
It's literally just like, sometimes you even catch a glimpse of the thing. Or somebody in the shop says, hey, I saw one of these cards. It was in and out, but like, yeah. it does exist. Yeah. And you're like, oh my gosh. And you mentioned collecting kind of being a chore. And so at this point, even with something like Fab or something that's one in 40, the internet means that two days after a set comes out, you can buy it online. Mm-hmm. Or the day the set comes out, a lot of times you can buy it. Sometimes you can pre-order it online right. before the set's even out. Or you can subscribe. Which is what we offer. Not to the boxes. I mean, like specific cards. Oh, to to the singles. Like people yeah. pre-order. Once this spoiler list is out, it's like I'll pre-sell you this because I'm going to open up boxes. I'll definitely get however many. Yeah. Um, and so uh, essentially, how much of it is the mystery and the chase? Because like I knew Charizard existed. I knew I wanted it, and I was after it for. I knew I I wanted this thing for a long time, and then there was a lot of gratification of finally getting it. Mm-hmm. Um, but like with the nine pocket pages, right? If you if you could just buy it do you even want to buy it yeah it's like even now the, the question was and this is we'll put it in into context for you too but it was you know let's say i i stopped collecting that uh set whenever i was like 13 14 moved on other things started uh, you know experiencing other things and then it was like right now i find that binder again and it's like oh my gosh i still love these so much but i'm missing two so would I, as an adult right now, just go online and buy those two cards? It probably might be ten dollars, twenty dollars, uh, depending on how rare they are. And I said, "Well, pr- I probably would, just to complete it." Yeah, just to check the box. Because then it's a closed loop. Because there is, there's another part of your psychology that, especially for a lot of people, this manifests in more uh, significant ways. Is I want to fully realize this thing. Mm-hmm. Like it has to be complete. There are people who collect for that reason, like uh, the we, person we won't name with Warhammer Champions. It was about the. It wasn't about having the better deck. Mm-hmm. It was about there's a theme here with vampires. Let's say, hypothetically, hypothetically, <laughs> and I have to get the cards I need to fully realize that it has to be its perfect realization. It doesn't have to be great, and maybe if you splash some non-vampire cards, it would be better. But within this theme, all of these cards are super synergistic. They work together and they create a complete picture of what this faction can do. And that was the pursuit. And it wasn't particularly great. Like, it was awesome. But it wasn't like, I need to go win the tournament now. There was no tournaments played. It was just simply, and still, this person who should not be mentioned has these decks built in their possession. And still thinks fondly of it and loves having that, possessing that. Same thing with like some old magic decks is just this idea of I've it's like I've done the thing as good as it can be done. And now it's over. It's complete. And I can set it there. And yeah. there it is. I mean, it's a similar satisfaction when a series or a movie ends well, like not just good, but like satisfactorily the box is checked. You need no more. Mm-hmm. And it is what it is. And it's a, a just you're happy with it, right? It's you're happy finished. With that like yeah. it's fully done. Mm-hmm. And there is something to that too. And you don't, if you start, if you introduce all these limitations, you might end up in a place where you never get the feeling of something yeah. being finished. And I think that for me, like the, um, obviously I play card games my whole life. So I like this vibe, but the mystery and the exploration, that's why I don't like spoilers. That's why I like sealed and draft. That's why I like sealed and draft. I don't know the whole set. Um, is something I derive a lot of enjoyment out of. And there's a lot of people that, that might not be true. Mm-hmm. So that, I'm curious to hear from people on the podcast discussion channel and yeah. Discord channel. Because for a collectible game, that's I feel like that's how I would enjoy it the most. Now, like even Sorcery, a perfect example. We've been doing that series. We're talking on stream today about kind of doing one box a month or one box every time we stream and just like building, slow building into something more question there though do you do you intend to have it all eventually like would you want to slowly collect into the full collection well one of the things that i is for whatever reason and i'm sure there i already know some of them one is there's just not a tournament reality here so sorcery to me is about exploration and collecting and art and it's a different vibe Mm -hmm. and if i know the people i'm going to be playing that game with because i'm not planning to go I might play, like if we host big sorcery stuff, I'll play with other people. But most of the time, I'm going to play it with you. I'm going to play it with the people around me that I know well that play this game. Mm -hmm. And so I will own a good amount of it. 
but I don't feel the in the way like the uniques work in that game where you can mm-hmm. only run one copy. Like there's a lot about it that I don't feel the need to own everything um, as much as like something like Flesh and Blood. It's like, well, if I ever want to play Warrior and there's a Warrior set happening, it's like I better go ahead and just get the Warrior stuff. Yeah, because I don't. I don't know if I'm ever going to want to use this in a thing, but I'm more comfortable not having everything in sorcery by like a much larger degree. Yeah. And it just harkens back to uh, something else we talked about on the cast, which is uh, card games, a sport Mm -hmm. basically that, that flesh and blood. And and it's been hard to put our finger exactly on the differences and why sorcery and so much of it is just presentation and and what they're saying and how they're uh, presenting the game to an audience. But it is it is absolutely clearly not intended to be pursued like a sport, mm-hmm. whereas flesh and blood and then magic for so long until commander kind of reset those priorities have. And a lot of competitive games following in those footsteps are all thinking about the competitive environment, the organized play and the tournaments. Right. And so it encourages you to pursue this at the highest level. And you can't if I'm trying to be the best football player. Right. Like I don't want to only have 20 pound weights. Like I have to have everything I could possibly need to be the best athlete I can be. And so you're just making it harder for yourself if you limit your collection for fab. If your idea is to compete at a high level and be the best at this, you got to have everything. And don't have that for sorcery. When you're asking, how do I enjoy this the most, right? Then at least consciously be making the decision that you are approaching this thing as a sport. And I derive a lot of enjoyment from Fab in that way. Absolutely. Like yeah. the daily testing sessions and all the conversations and like in the collecting for me when it comes to flesh and blood is way lower on the priority scale, which is why I'm collecting it so aggressively. It was funny. I mean, <laughs> I'm collecting it and I there is a certain amount of collector in me. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I like having the, the fancy stuff and using it, right? Yeah. I'm not just completing it and putting it in a case somewhere. Um, but at the same time, I'm getting a ton of enjoyment, like well beyond whatever the cost of entry is for me out of that experience. And so that's a fine thing for it to be. But in the face of that, we're playing the sorcery stream and asking questions like I, I'm not even inclined to own it all. Like, like the product, even the product I bought from the Kickstarter was just I'm buying more than I think I would want to buy. Because I'm not, in that case, I'm not going to be able to buy it again. Yeah. The way the alpha worked. And I don't plan on just opening it all. You're just going to open all the boxes all at once. Yeah. It's like, I'm I'm actually asking the question. It's going to be a long time before the set. I don't know. The second set might come quicker, I guess. But the number of sets coming out for the game are so slow. One a year. It's like, I have time Mm. to slowly die. Like, the idea of three or four years from now still having the sealed box of set one that people are getting together and it's like, hey, you guys want to do a draft? You mean put it on eBay, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but it's like, oh, you want to do a seal or draft thing? How cool would that how, be? How great. Right. Yeah. Talk, talking about the enjoyment you get. See, and this is, it just gets back to this, this fundamental question and, and it's so well expressed in tabletop because there is conceivably no harm in it in whatever pursuit you take in it. Uh, no direct harm, at least. And then there's a lot of upside, too, of community and, and chatting about it and finding a, a group of people who are pursuing a game and enjoying it in the same way that you want to. But you, even just in this conversation we mentioned, asking the question, how do I enjoy this the most? Your answer might be, I want to perfect myself. I want to be the best at this. I want to challenge myself, and I want to realize myself through this. And there's immense enjoyment when you do well in a tournament, right? Brendan Patrick, our great friend over at Arsenal Pass. Punching bag a little bit. Uh, I talked to him about this pretty extensively, and he cannot but do that with almost anything that he gets That's into. That's just how he approaches things. Yeah, we, talk, we were talking about World of Warcraft back in the day, and Jonathan and I were playing this together, having a grand time, taking it slow, wandering through. We would read all the story text. We would wander through the forest just because. We wouldn't go for any quests or... Brennan was already max level, like mm, day two. Mm-hmm. He was like, I want to be the best. I want to be the best raider. I want to have the best gear. I want to have, and it's like, that's awesome. Like you really enjoyed that pursuit and got a lot of, uh, you know, you felt really good about that. Um, so that's one thing you can do is like you can realize yourself in that way. Or it could be about discovery for you, right? It could be about slowly finding the cards and seeing what the cards are. That's more difficult these days. 
because discovery as a whole is just more difficult uh, because everything is available at our fingertips. So you have to be very careful and precise about how you approach even engaging with the community if discovery is your main thing. But if you find the right group of three or four or five or six people to do that with, everybody in that group is maximizing enjoyment by discovering slowly together. And whether that's I'm not spending a bunch of money or I'm getting to slowly find all these cards or everybody's relatively balanced because nobody has more cards than anybody else. Those are all different avenues in that enjoyment stream. There are some people maximizing enjoyment is getting every single card all at the start and completing a four of, three of, two of play set of absolutely everything that they can get, putting it in a binder, looking at it, scrolling from page to page and going like, ah, oh, this is amazing. And then maybe putting it in a, a filing cabinet and just saying, I've got the first set of sorcery. That could be like your pursuit and why, how you're enjoying this. There are some people we talk about it in the podcast discussion group take that a step further and it's like i'm not trying to find just charizard for i'm trying to find that 9.5 grade mm, charizard mm-hmm. so now it's not just i need to pull it but i need to find the perfect one that's perfectly centered the corners are excellent etc yeah. and there's also silos too right like i'm gonna get all the red cards yeah yeah or totally. i'm gonna get all the foil red cards that are hard to get right or i'm gonna get all the marvel dragons in the flesh and blood set yeah um so there's a lot of ways but i think it's just important to step back and ask what you would enjoy the most and see if you can pursue whatever you're doing in that way. Yeah. Uh, and it's just really hitting home with this dichotomy, uh, really this difference in experience from fab to sorcery for me personally. Yeah, and I think the the main thing on my side, and I love playing limited and fab, and I've really leaned into that more because I do realize that that's where I have the most enjoyment. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't also enjoy constructed. So you can, it's not a, it's not a yes, no yeah. kind of binary. It's messy. But it's that I think we need to recognize there's a lot of pressure and has been for the past, well, for a long time, I would say, with tabletop games in particular, with expandable games in particular, that the goal and the assumption is that you get everything, you have everything, and you play to win. And you play to be the best person, and the game grows through tournaments and organized play and national championships and world championships and these kinds of things. And that if if you're not immediately saying that's the way I want to enjoy this game, it can feel very isolating and like, I want to have this game and I want to play it because I love the mechanics. I love the idea of it, but everybody just keeps telling me I've got to do it this way. And I either don't have the money or I, I would enjoy doing that. And so it's really just taking that step back, like you're saying, and just having, it's not even having permission, but there, there is, equal validity in you enjoying these games in the way that you want to enjoy them and you don't have to abide by the common competitive collect it all get it all as fast as possible compete mindset that you see a lot uh publicly yeah and i think we need to refine that and rekindle that and sometimes that means imposing limitations on yourself on your group which can be tough and maybe finding one or more other people who are willing to do that isn't it funny or ironic, maybe it's not ironic. I think it's ironic. Like that Alanis Morissette song? Unlike that. That's irony. Um, that Magic started all this and had none of that. Mm-hmm. Right? It was Wild yeah. West. Discovery, there's no tournaments. Like, Grab some packs. Totally different. I also think one one thing I wanted to mention before we get out of here. I mean, we we have a self-imposed but also partly financial restriction when it comes to throwbacks. Mm-hmm. When we're playing the throwback series, particularly for Star Wars CCG and Lord of the Rings CCG, it's one box meta, yeah. set to set. And I will say, going set by set, using a single box, has been remarkably fun mm-hmm. in both cases. A lot like the variety of experiences we had with those two games. Obviously, that's now somewhat of an expensive pursuit, so it is easier to be restricted on that. Yeah, because uh, every box is crazy at this point, but. That is, I think, a really good example, too. That's part of leading into this kind of a conversation. You just experience it. Like, we're having so much fun. It's so much fun. And how crazy would it be if everyone were, if everyone agreed to, it's like the prisoner's dilemma, right? It's It's like like if everyone who wanted to do that was all doing it at once. It would be very fun. 
How how great would that be? Yeah. So that's an interesting concept. We'll see if it pans out anywhere in the future. Yeah, and long story short, sometimes you just really have to ask the question: how how would I actually enjoy this the most? And then do you got to go do it. Yeah, yeah, and that's true of everything. Sometimes that means uh, you know you're like me and you are a hoity toity coffee person. You make a French press, it might take you twenty minutes. That's fine. Yeah. It's very enjoyable. I love it. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for listening, and uh, we hope uh, you enjoyed the conversation today. You can always join us on the Discord, on the Covenant Discord, uh, for those at home, not in front of a computer, maybe. It's cov.link, C-O-V dot L-A-N-K slash Discord, and that will get you to the invite. So you can join up, and there's a podcast discussion thread as well as a bunch of, other, bunch of other channels for all the various games you might be interested in. You can jump in there and uh, let us know what you think about the podcast and uh, these concepts, these theories, and if self-restriction in the name of enjoyment in this kind of way is something that uh, you also would like to see. And it's worth mentioning, uh, we're going to be not streaming or podcasting for a couple of weeks. That's right. Um, Steven's going on vacation. We're maximizing enjoyment. That's right. I'm going to uh, <laughs> France to play in a fab tournament. If you're going to be there, definitely say hello. Be happy to, to chat with anyone that's listening. And uh, we look forward to being back in two or three weeks from now. You know, I guess that does beg the question. Um, I'm going to Bermuda to visit some friends who one of them got a job there. So you kind of have to go. When Use you it can. while you got it. If I could be in Bermuda all the time, would I enjoy that more than just going once every couple of years? Honestly, it's it's part of what I think makes Tulsa, Oklahoma so sticky. It's, it's easy to go other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it's just built for people that like the way gratification. Or, you know, maybe I should try 10 years on a beach just to see. I mean, just to find out. It's it's honestly a phenom phenomenal question. It's sort yeah. of like um, <laughs> people who look forward to retiring. Yeah. Where it's like, you think you would enjoy having nothing to do, and you might. I I think I would, though. Yeah. But you also might get tired of it. I might. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. When Shannon says that, I always say, I would at least like to find out. Well, I, that is the thing. We can, like, we can always find out. It's like when people say you're not happy, you know, you're not more happy whenever you have more than $70,000 a year. And it's like, I'd like to find that out for myself. I, Thank you. I, I'll, I'll try it. Let's we'll see. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a little different. Again, it's like self harm or, or health is like, if I ate four Oreos every day for a year, I don't want to find out what happens. Yeah. Because I think it's not good. I'm pretty sure. But I, I would check out a beach for a year and see how I feel <laughs> after that. And, and, mm -hmm. See if, see if I can maintain that, that lifestyle. Maybe uh, one day, man. Maybe yeah. one day. Well, thank you so much for listening, everybody. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Until then, keep playing.